In the previous video, Dr. Tomlinson described differentiation as establishing clear goals, assessing progress, and adjusting instruction so that each student learns as much as possible, as efficiently as possible. In this video, Dr. Tomlinson will talk about the importance of teachers having the proper mindset towards student success, and how that mindset relates to instruction. She will also look more closely at the teacher's role in setting goals and providing students the support they need to reach those goals. And now, Dr. Tomlinson. Okay, um, I want us to look at this one. My, my plan for today was to get us to look a little bit at what this issue of differentiation is, and including the kinds of questions you're raising, and then at this one principle. Of the five principles that I'm gonna talk with you about, related to what I think makes differentiation significant in children's lives. This may be the one that most of us take for granted. I know in my 20 years in public school, we never spent a faculty meeting talking about these things. We talked about how to get kids into lockers when they didn't know the combinations. We talked about teachers standing in the hall to monitor behavior. We talked about giving tests and you know, using assessment data. We talked about ways to use textbooks. We never talked about this stuff, and yet I think our principals assumed we were all cool with it, and we just kind of take for granted that it'll be there. I think we're having more and more research that suggests to us that we can't take it for granted, and most particularly that we can't let the press for tests take this away from us. And there are two reasons for that. Without this first principle we're gonna talk about, um, the chances are you're not even going to succeed on that test because without this, learning is shut down for too many kids. In addition to that, again, we've got that lifelong thing. And if we don't have some of this first principle in tow pretty well, we're creating problems this year that are going to escalate through the years with kids. So I want to talk with you about a progression that is one I'm not sure I had even made the connection on until the last couple of years. Um, and maybe I don't have it right yet, but I think these pieces are important. And that is, before you and I ever open the book, before we ever decide what our text is going to be, before we ever decide what our sequence of skills is going to be, we need to be thinking about who we are as human beings, how we're relating to kids as human beings, and how we're helping the kids relate to each other as human beings. That's invisible, and it permeates everything. And we'll talk about that as we go. Um, I want to ask you to do a little task for a couple of minutes, and I'm not going to give you terribly long for this, but if you are a, a, a specialist, somebody who is a special ed teacher, a reading teacher, ELL, gifted ed, technology, your job is to go into the classroom and help other teachers figure out how to do things, or you have special classes of kids that you have of your own or both you might want to do the task that is sort of pea green. If you're a teacher who now has, or at some point has taught some low-end classes, kids that just have had a hard time being successful in school, their buy-in is just not great, their success rate's not great, and if those kids fascinate you and trouble you, you might want to look at this perspective. If you're a teacher who has taught or does teach high-end kids, high school honors, AP, IB, advanced classes, teachers in the elementary grades who tend to end up with a lot of highly able kids in your school, you might want to hit the yellow one. If you are a person who um, is a regular classroom teacher or a principal whose job is largely focused on how we just teach all kids to move ahead and do stuff, then you might want to try this task. And if you're a university faculty member or if you're a school administrator, and you want to kind of look at this big picture thing, you might take the orange one. What I'm going to ask you to do is a raft assignment that is coded by those colors. And here's how a raft assignment works. I'm going to ask you to very quickly choose a role to work on. And I'm so you might be a discouraged math student, a kid who thinks this never works for me. I've not been good at math in years. You're going to be doing something for somebody in that student's case you're going to be writing something for a teacher. 
there's going to be a format that you'll do your work in. And for this kid, it's going to be a note that he leaves on his teacher's desk. And the topic that he's going to address in that note is, so here's why I can't do math. Here's why math doesn't work for me. Here's why I'm no good in math. If you're a... Um, if you took the second role, and that was the teacher who has struggled with some low-end classes, take on the role of a brand new teacher. Your audience is a more experienced colleague, and what you're doing is a true confession um, to that more experienced colleague. Let me tell you how I feel every day when those low-end kids come into my classroom. <laughs> Let me tell you what starts going on in my head or what starts going on in my stomach when I see all of them coming my way and I know how many problems there are there together and how many struggles we're going to have. So that's kind of how that works. Choose one of these and just for a couple of minutes, um, jot down some thoughts from that particular role to the specified audience in the specified format on the topic that's here. And let me kind of tell you guys what I'm aiming at for all of you with this. What is it in school that gives kids messages about teachers' beliefs in them and who we think is smart and who we think is not smart and how school sort of works to make those messages real clear? That's kind of the piece that all of us have in common, even though we may not be aware of it. School sends lots of messages to kids about who's smart, who's not, who's going to be successful, who's not, and what teachers and leaders think about that. So that's kind of the perspective you're coming from. Take just a couple of minutes and work on this. Okay, let me remind you now as you start to share with each other, the point of this is how do kids in school figure out who's smart, who has a chance, who's going to make it, who's not going to make it? What are the messages we send to kids and how does that happen and how does it sort of impact their thinking about school? So let me get you again to work this time if you can with a pair. If you need to move to do that, introduce yourself to somebody, do. But see what two of you did, share what you're thinking, and after you've had a chance to share it, come back to that question. So what are we saying about the messages school sends kids about who's going to succeed and who's not and how all that works? Take just a minute to do that. I'll get you to clap again in a few minutes. What did you do? Um, I wrote the letter to okay. um, the discouraged student and said, I can't do math because I don't get the numbers in the word problem. I don't know when to do what type of problem. It all looks the same to me. I practice my timetables but can't remember them all, all the time, and I don't think I'm good at math. And I did that because a lot of the kids, they think, oh, if I practice my math facts, you know, they don't understand the root cause for the problem or, the, like you said, the questions that they need right. to ask in order to fix their problem. my David Letterman, I start out with, that's a good suggestion. Yeah. We're really looking to go this in a different I direction. Yeah. Who am I talking about? I did the letter too, but I did. I don't get what to do. I cannot see what you mean by A plus B equals C in my head. What does that have to do with numbers? I can't get it in my mind what that looks like. These formulas don't make any sense to me. We move too fast. I don't get what all of those signs mean. Please slow down and help me. And you know what it sounds like? It sounds like a communication problem, too. A lot of what we say. Like, we don't ever ask our kids. I mean, we do. Oh, we do all understand this. Do you get this? Can I answer any questions? But you're right. There's no other way for us to sit there and have good, authentic conversation about what holes they have on a day-to-day -day basis that need to be filled. That's where the whole thing was with trans trans differentiation and doing that constant assessment, constantly looking at seeing how are we addressing the kids' learning zone, how are we understanding if the kid needs the manipulatives, if they need something like hands-on equation, how are we addressing the kids' learning Johnny can't strike a match in your classroom, you're elaborating. On this one, what I asked you to do was a raft assignment, and if you're not familiar with this, it's a really excellent strategy, again, to use in any subject. It works beautifully in math, science, social studies, computer um, technology, art, anything. And what you ask the kid, the, the name raft comes from the first letter of each of those four uh, words. And the nice thing in terms of differentiation is 
that I sort of let you choose by your interest or your role. And many of you have played more than one of these roles in your lives, so you kind of pick the one that you were interested in thinking about. But once we're there, um, these leave a lot of learning profile options open. This is writing, but it's short writing. This one could be written, but it could also be delivered orally if you had a kid who just doesn't write but could really, you know, or preferred talking it out. Um, the Droodle thing allows you to do some sort of visual expression. The top 10 list, again, is um, more writing probably than the note, although a note could be three pages long if a kid wanted it to be, but it's a little more structured. And the chart is a little bit more of an analytical kind of reasoning sort of thing. For all of you, um, the question, the essential question that we were working with really is how do perceptions of teaching and learning um, impact what happens in achievement in a classroom? How, how does our sense and kids' sense of who's smart affect what happens from that point on out? Um, just to give you an example or two of some raft strips to show you kind of why they're um, effective with kids, usually start with just sort of a blank grid like this and fill it in. You could just have three strips if you wanted to. You could have six strips. There's no number that's required. And you can assign them to kids by colors or numbers or names, or you can let them choose depending on what you want to do. Um, and again, you can, you can vary the complexity of the strip so there's a readiness element. You can have different topics that the kids would address, even although they're going in the same direction based on interest or the learning profile options, which frequently fit well here. I want to show you just a few examples of RAF strips. These are not assignments because they're random strips. They don't go together. But it kind of shows you why kids respond to them. Um, a middle school teacher teaching grammar asked her kids to take on the role of a semicolon, writing to middle schoolers, a diary entry, I wish you really understood where I belong. That's so much more interesting to middle schoolers than write the rule for where semicolons go, and they get more involved, and you can tell a lot. Um, a raindrop in science writing to future droplets, an advice column, the beauty of cycles, much more involving than draw a picture of the water cycle and label it. If I see why it's a beautiful thing, then I really see how it works. Um, Fractions, writing to whole numbers in math, a petition to be considered part of the family. I really have to understand the relationship between a fraction and a whole number to be able to do that. Or I'd love this as a pre-assessment. A word problem, writing to students in your own classroom, a set of directions, how to get to know me. Do kids have a method for trying to unpack math or do they just kind of go at it? Um, I love this one. This was a kindergarten teacher and she had read The Gingerbread Man with her kids. The Gingerbread Man was writing to our, I mean, talking to our class, an oral response, because these are kindergartners and they can't write but so much. And the topic is, I never should have listened to the fox. <laughs> Often with kindergartners, you know, or first graders will say, just tell me what happened in the story and we miss the meaning altogether. The kids really have to grapple with the meaning here. Um, I love this one, it was an elementary teacher doing social studies. <laughs> And the kids took on the role of Squanto. Their audience was other Native Americans. Their format was pictographs, which is great because it allows both writing and drawing. And the topic is, I can help the inept settlers. And it's wonderful because it turns it on its head. We, we think of the, you know, the settlers as being the good guys and the natives as being the folks who were sort of marginal when in fact they had the coping skills the rest of the folks needed. And so putting that perspective on it is important. Um, positive numbers, writing to negative numbers, a dating ad, opposite subtract. <laughs> rational numbers to irrational numbers, a song, must you go on forever. <laughs> Decimals, writing to fractions, a poem, don't you get my point. And this, by the way, could be a thing where Gardner talks about using a strength to build to a weakness. If you had a kid who was really good with writing and imagination, but wasn't relating to math, writing that poem might be a satisfactory way for them to really grapple with the math content. Monet writing to Van Gogh a letter, I wish you'd shed more light on the subject. <laughs> and this teacher, who was a, f a first grade teacher, actually um, had her uh, kids do this every year, 
her first graders wrote to the kindergartners who were about to become first graders an ad, what's best about first grade, and then she sort of passed those on. And these are not assignments because they're just one strip and you'd probably need three or four so you had some choices in there, but it gives you a sense of how teachers would start. And it's much livelier than many things we do and lends itself well to readiness, interest, and learning profile differentiation. Um, in the time that we have left, I want to work with this, and then we'll finish this progression tomorrow. But here's what I think. I think you and I have a mindset, and I think that because of the work of somebody I'm going to share with you in a minute. And I think that mindset has a lot to do with how we connect with kids, how we see them, how we regard them when they come to us. And then I think our connections, as one of your colleagues says, has an impact on the degree to which we establish a real team, a real community in our classroom, whether it's just a collection of kids or whether we're a group pulling together. So we're gonna look at this first step for just a second. And my hunch is that th th this progression paves the way to learning. It's not about the textbook, it's before that in a way, and it wraps around everything, but it opens up learning. There's a woman whose name is Carol Dweck, D-W-E-C-K, and um, actually I think if I'm correct, there, there'll be a time this week when there's a, the bookstore comes over here and has some books that if you wanna look at them, you can get, and they typically ask us what's one we're gonna mention, and, and hers is one I gave them the name for. She's a professor who's been around the block a long time, and does a lot of work with motivation in school. Her work is highly regarded and I pretty much never see a dissertation that has anything to do with motivation to learn that isn't using some of her work there. Several years ago, some of her students went to her, her doctoral students, and said, you know, the work that you're writing is really revolutionary. It really truly does change people's lives when they read it. But the trouble is you put it all in scholarly journals and they've got a reading audience of like 100 each. And if you'd write it in English so normal people could read it, it would have a real impact. Her, her scholarly work is actually very readable. She's a fascinating woman, but she did that. She took her student's advice and she wrote a book for the public called Mindset. And it talks about her 30 years of research. And here's kind of her bottom line. <coughs> And I want you to think a little bit about what this has to do with the raft task that you did. Over 30 years, she has determined that you and I and everybody else, including your students, pretty early in life develop a mindset about what it means to be smart and successful, where smart comes from, where success comes from. And once we develop that mindset, it impacts how we move forward. Now, I sometimes forget to say this, so I want to be sure to say it to you. One thing she finds is we can change our mindset. If we have a different set of experiences, if we rethink things, we can change our mindset so we're not stuck with it, and neither are our kids. But we develop this unconscious mindset, and here's kind of how it goes for the most part. One kind of mindset that we can develop is what she calls a fixed mindset. And a fixed mindset, when I tell you what it means in terms of success, sounds so reasonable that you can't quite exactly figure out what the alternative would be in this country, though not all countries frame it this way. Not all cultures do. With a fixed mindset, we think, you know where ability comes from? Success, the likelihood of being really good in something? It comes from heredity and environment. And so if you have a parent who's a smart parent, Plus, that parent reads to the kids and takes them on little excursions, you know, and teaches them about stuff in the neighborhood. That's where success comes from. It comes from being smart, which is the result of genetics and environment. And um, what that really means is some kids are born to be smart and nurtured in that direction even more and other kids are not born with such a propensity to be smart, and they come from environments that just don't nurture the smarts as much. And that's how when kids come to school, their success is determined by that heredity and environment in large measure. And most of us as teachers, Dweck says, want to help kids. And so it's not that we're gonna say, okay, I'm, not, I'm only gonna teach this kind of kid. Um, but the truth of the matter is, if you have a fixed mindset, you really sort of believe that there's some kids you can only take so far. 
And there's some kids that are gonna be much easier to get someplace, and in fact, they don't even need us very much because they're already pretty much ahead. Um, because environment and heredity have determined that. And so while we teach everybody, we don't teach with the gangbusters um, conviction that every blessed kid in this room is gonna get this stuff. And there's just really no doubt about it. The second option we have for a mindset is what she calls a fluid mindset or a growth mindset. She uses those two terms interchangeably. And people with a growth mindset are a little wacky. They're kind of out in left field compared to sort of the general way of seeing things. Those folks actually say, you know where success comes from? It doesn't come from being, from a heredity and environment largely. Where would you think their idea would, would say? Where it really comes from is effort. The person who's willing to work hard is going to get there. If any of you've read Malcolm Gladwell's Outliers, it's a new book that's really, really fascinating. And where he's talking, what he's talking about is people who really succeed, what sets them apart from other people. And his first chapter is on the 10,000 hour hypothesis. People who are hugely successful in their areas can almost always demonstrate that they invested 10,000 hours up to the point where the success propelled forward and other people who were less successful didn't invest that time. And there are other factors in Gladwell's work, but he agrees, effort is a huge thing. And so people with a, fixed mind, with a fluid mindset say, you know what, it's not that the bell curve doesn't exist. Clearly heredity and environment are real things. Dweck's a psychologist, she knows that. But her conviction is, with enough work, almost anybody can do almost anything. And so the role of the teacher then becomes to override a profile that looks unsuccessful. And to do that, the teacher sets very high expectations and a very high support system and starts moving in that direction with absolutely no thought but that what success is going to happen. Um, which are our schools in this country predominantly, a fixed mindset or a fluid one? Yes. Yeah. We have a fixed mindset society. And so those little messages that you may have mentioned, do you think a kid doesn't know the difference between the top reading group, the bottom reading group, and the middle reading group, if you've got those? And how do you suppose the teacher in the bottom group teaches the same kind of thinking and reasoning and with the same enthusiasm that the teacher who has the top group teaches? I taught a long time, and there are not many mistakes I haven't made, and I continue to make a fair number of them fairly regularly, so I'm pretty acquainted with them. And I know what the feeling in the pit of my stomach was as a seventh grade teacher. I had a low class every year right before lunch. I don't know what it was about that. Every blessed year right before lunch. And it wasn't that I didn't like the kids. But I'd think, oh my gosh, got to be a lot sterner here. Can't give the kids quite all those activities to do because they can't handle the movement. One kid says something that sets off the other kids in there, and it feels a little wacky. And I was a different person with that group than I was with the group that I knew could handle anything I threw at them. My personality changed, my delivery changed, my plans for them changed, and their message is all over the place. Kid may be having trouble with reading, but that doesn't mean they're stupid. And besides that, Dweck says, not only do we create problems for the kid in the low group, but we pre create problems for kids that we say you are smart, which then means I should not have to work because effort is the different category than smart. And so if you're asking me to work, you're challenging my smartness. Don't like that. Believe I'll hang off there. And there are long-term impacts there as well. We do the bluebirds, buzzards, and wombats in regard to literacy still. And we have a lot of schools where we say, yeah, we have heterogeneous home rooms, all right, but when it comes to reading, Mr. Johnson gets the really high kids, and Ms. Thompson gets the middle kids, and Mr. Dithers gets the kids who are struggling, and so we separate them out for reading. You can't draw a conclusion for every setting in every school, but we ought to be asking ourselves to what degree is our instruction so wonderful that it overrides all those messages. And is our instruction set up in such a way that we're teaching those strugglers more slowly and more, with more reservation than we're teaching the other kids? 
um, Pam Mueller wrote a really interesting book called Lifers. And in that, she says, no matter how well a child in the lower reading groups might have read, he was destined to remain in the same reading group. This is, in a sense, another manifestation of the self-fulfilling prophecy in that a slow learner had no option but to continue to be a slow learner regardless of performance and potential. And we have a real problem with that in literacy in that many times when kids from low income backgrounds come in, they don't have those pre-reading skills we're looking for. And so we draw the conclusion that they're not ready, they can't do whatever, and then we put them in that low reading group and we remediate them while the rest of the world moves forward. And they have almost no chance of ever moving out of that expectation. In other words, we look at them and think, boy, you're coming from a tough place, environment, heredity, not in your corner. I'll do the best I can with you, but I don't have many expectations that you're going to bloom with this. Um, this is an interesting thing that Jessica Hockett, who's one of our presenters here, sent me a couple of weeks ago out of the New York Times, um, talking about what happens in terms of mindset in kind of an interesting setting. Just telling students that their intelligence is under their own control improves their effort on schoolwork and performance. In two separate studies, this researcher, Aronson, and others taught black and Hispanic junior high kids how the brain works, explaining that the students possess the ability, if they worked hard, to make themselves smarter. This erased up to half the difference between white and minority achievement levels. If we could get rid of half the achievement gap in our schools as a result of a year of work, we'd think we were doing pretty darn well. They weren't even teaching the kids how to read. They were teaching the kids that your brain is under your control and that if you keep working at it, you can succeed. Why was that revolutionary? Because most of these kids are in a fixed mindset society and they're on the bottom of the fixed mindset totem pole. And they keep getting the message is you're not smart, you won't succeed. And that makes a huge difference. Here's a question for you to kind of leave with and ponder until we come back tomorrow. How do you look at students differently if you have a fluid or growth mindset versus if you have a fixed mindset? What does that do with how you see the kid, what you say to the kid, how the kid sees you interact with this child versus this child? And what does that then have to do moving forward with how we invest in kids, how we connect with them, and how we teach them. And we'll talk a little bit more about that tomorrow. As Dr. Tomlinson pointed out, just having the proper growth mindset can help students overcome learning deficits and succeed beyond expectations. In the next video, Dr. Tomlinson will look closer at differentiation and instruction as she demonstrates how teachers' connections with students can work as a bridge to a quality curriculum.